You are live, says the screen. <laughs> it's another Wednesday Wine with Ana Belaval. It's so much fun to join you today. How's your Wednesday going? Where are you joining us from? Have you poured yourself a little something? Something, whatever gets you through, even if it's not booze, even if it's chocolate cake, even if it's whatever is your indulgence, chips, salty, savory, whatever. Go ahead, bring it over. Let's have a great conversation among us and learn something from each other. It's Wednesday Wine live from Chicago. I'm Ana Belaval. And as you know, I started this during the pandemic because I was um, connecting to all of you. And on a Wednesday, which is my hardest day of the week, I don't like Wednesdays. And I hate saying that because my daughter was born on a Wednesday, but I pretend she could have been born on a Tuesday. Um, but they're just hard. They're in the middle. They're too close to Monday, not close enough to the weekend. And we just have to muscle through hump day. So hello to everyone joining us. This is fantastic. It's great to see you here. And I want to introduce you to somebody that you and I are going to meet at the same time, which is ironic because CBS News correspondent Lilia Luciano and I have lived parallel lives, except she's a lot younger than me. But Lilia and I have the same upbringing, born and raised in Puerto Rico, went to the same high school, almost know all the same people. And for a few years, we worked in the same place. And I've always admired her from afar. She's kind of like my Ricky Martin, always so close and so far. I've never met her. But I remember seeing her in one of these like showy entertainment shows and realizing she was Puerto Rican and thinking, this girl is so talented. Oh my God, what is this girl doing in this show? Oh my goodness. And I could tell that she wanted more. And then a friend of mine from Univision Chicago told me she wants to be an investigative reporter. And I said, oh yeah, she has to be. And she knew it too. And so, por cosa del destino, around three weeks ago, we both ended up in an alumni publication, real nerd, and we connected. And I am excited that she's excited and has agreed to join me today, everybody. This is the one and only amazing Lilia Luciano. Hello, ah! my friend. Ah! <laughs> oh my God, I'm so excited to see you. I'm so sorry that I'm in the car. I am between shoots and I, you know, I, I in a non-COVID world, I would go to a yeah. cafe in between and do yeah. this. Um, but, you know, it's LA, so it's... <laughs> There's a there's a pandemic and we're always spiking. So I'm just hiding in my car. You're okay. hiding your car and there's always traffic. Is traffic getting any better now that everyone's at home? You know, uh, I don't think so from what I'm seeing because I'm looking yeah. at I-10. <laughs> uh -huh. It's still bad. Yeah, It's bad in LA. Uh, I think people still work. At least schools aren't in session. Kids aren't going to school. So that's different. But yeah. uh, backtracking. I don't think there's anyone in the entire universe that we know with whom I share more facts or like facets of life. I mean, your life, your career, we, we went to Perpetuo, same school. Yeah. And, you know, when I hear you talk about your career and the paths that you've taken mm -hmm. and the firsts, uh, it, it's so shocking. And the funniest part about all of this was when I saw your interview with Ricky, <laughs> I I have always claimed to be Ricky Martin's number one fan. You could not see the walls on my on my bedroom because they were all plastered with his face throughout my entire you know adolescence. And right. I honestly I had to prepare so much to interview him the first time I did because I was going to react exactly as you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feared. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, after I saw your interview, I was like, oh, man, that, that was an option. I totally <laughs> lost my... Well, I lost, I lost my cool when I didn't know he was on. When, I, when we were on, I was the indigna. I mean, like, I was Ana Victoria Belaval's daughter. Oh, yeah, because it was a satellite yeah, yeah, yeah. interview, and I was like, bien digna, and I, I, I thanked him like my mother would for, you know, helping us out during the hurricane, and then yeah. I asked him a couple questions, and then they went off the air, and I thought that we were off the air. No oh, one told me he was listening. Oh, I was, I, so I, I, I knew I was on the air in Chicago with my coworkers, 
And they said, Belaval, we've never seen you this giddy. Oh my God. And I yeah. said, you don't understand when you're a member of a minority and somebody, you know, uh, from your island that sometimes has negative connotations all over the world makes it and you can say his you can say because Puerto Rico. God. <laughs> and they say Ricky Martin you go ese mi primo you know you go nuts and I didn't know he was listening and these yeah. a-holes punch it and he's going like this listening and they go they go Ricky don't worry we we're getting the restraining order and I go oh my god <laughs> I am going to kill you. I love that. Well, I mean, if it makes you feel any better, when I interviewed him, I offered to mother his children. Thank you. I offered to babysit. Yeah, no, I literally said, he said, you know, I asked him in a very professional manner, what yes. do you still need to achieve in life? I mean, you've oh done it God. all. And he said, well, they say that every man has to you know, write a book, have a child and plant a tree. And he said, I've planted many trees. And I'm like, Oh, I can definitely help you with the other. And he's like, yeah, you're a journalist. You can help me write my book. I was like, no, no, no. I meant the baby. <laughs> and I think you only did that because we all come from the same place. Like you knew yeah. he wasn't going to freak out on you or think that yeah. you're a creep. Plus he's probably no, no, used no. to all of us. He's you know. still, I still, you know, post stuff like that on Instagram and he always likes it. And he's been so supportive of my career. You know, the day I won a GLAD award, I can't remember mm -hmm. if he called me or someone called me with him. Yeah, I think he called me on my phone or tweeted. Mira, stop showing off. Que voy a llorar. Te lo juro. Because nobody, nobody from his team wants me anywhere near him, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. When Mira, he, man. He'll react to my Instagram post, so I'll post this so he follows me. Cha cha. You know, you tell him, listen, I I know she comes from a good family, like she normal comes from, people. She comes from a good place, you know. From a good place. She, from a good place. she won't. She likes, you. she likes you like your older sister will like you. <laughs> not creepy. Not creepy. Okay, yeah, Lilia. Since we brought up, me. yeah, enough. That's bueno. <laughs> even though, so even though when I see when I see um uh -huh. shooting stars. Uh, to oh be God. honest, I never know what to wish because for half of my life, it was just Mary Ricky Martin. <laughs> Callate. Are you for real? I'm always like, oh, 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 I don't have any more wishes. I don't know like what to do now. <laughs> I don't have any more wishes. Okay. So listen, I don't know if you can see this because you're on the, ah, in the yes. car. Okay. This is how much we have in common. So wow. tell me. Uh -huh. Lilia started her career at uh, a Spanish show called Escándalo TV. Yeah. When you see that picture, who do you see? <laughs> As yourself. You? When you see that picture of yourself, what do you see? What um, do you remember? I, I was just looking at you and I'm like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is so weird. It looks like the same hair, uh -huh. the same big earrings. I, I swear yep. I had those earrings. I had those halter tops. You know, very similar. And that's the thing that, like, I used to, to be honest, I used to think that I was the first person ever to cross over from Spanish language, you know, media to English, at least in news and journalism. Mm -hmm. And then I realized at some point a few years back that actually, no, you had done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And some people wonder if I'm really a journalist, but at least that's what I went for college. It's really oh, interesting. Yeah. Because you started in entertainment and I started in news, and then mm -hmm. I switched. I switched to features, yeah. and you switched back to news. How was that transition? Because honestly, so when I see that picture, I had so many hangups because they had told me I was too white for Spanish TV. I had a big nose, fat arms. Like it was all about how I looked. I wasn't sexy enough to host that show, but I loved those people. I loved those coworkers. I loved the producer. And I credit that show, Despierta America, like my master's degree. It's the reason why I do now what I, what I do. Yeah. So do you feel the same way, even though that's really not who you are? No, I feel like, I mean, yes, everyone, all of my friends, my best friend, Pili, who I hope is watching, mm -hmm. me, she was all jealous about like, who's this girl? Who's this girlfriend you're posting about on Instagram? So I hope she's watching. I know, Peely. <laughs> when we split 
ways and I was starting my internship in news and she left Miami mm-hmm. uh, we I, I was going into news to follow my dream of being a journalist mm-hmm. and we kind of lost touch for a little bit and I remember finding her years later and she was like I remember leaving you in news and then mm-hmm. I caught up and I saw you on TV and it was like who is this <laughs> like that was uh-huh. never you uh-huh and, you know, and part of it, part of the persona, part of the, you know, the extensions and the lashes. And, mm-hmm. and as I say this, I am totally wearing fake lashes now. So I'm like now back to embracing makeup. But for the yep. longest time, I rebelled against that. I wouldn't even wear mascara, lipstick, sombra, nothing. Um, because I felt like I somehow needed to prove that that is kind of the persona is not who I was. And mm-hmm. honestly, now I think about it and it's very unfair and it's very unfortunate that I thought that because I had developed this, you know, bombshell sexy thing, somehow that took away credit from my journalistic integrity, from my intelligence, from my productivity, from my storytelling. Hey, I mean, you can look hot and be super credible. And that's, you know, that's the patriarchy. That's el machismo, you know, that's, that's, that, those are those ideas that separate it. But, but I think it, as, as long as it is your choice. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think so that's, that's, that's where it is. Yeah, that is where, you know, that's the other part of it is, you know, I, I always, I always appreciate and I always credit my experiences at Escándalo um, and, and my boss then, Luz Maria Doria, who yeah. I always knew she would become the Latin Oprah and now she's on her third book, I think, and she totally is the Latin Oprah. A productive um, woman. Productive, brilliant mm-hmm. storyteller, brilliant interviewer, brilliant leader. She always, you know, believed in me and knew that there was so much more that I could do. And she always celebrated my smarts. She allowed me to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, okay, Luma, I'm going to go do a behind the scenes special with Wisin Yandel in Colombia in their private plane. Sure, go. Like, <laughs> budget, no problem. Uh, Luma, how about, you know, we would come up with these, like, features of... um Lo mejor de, or like Famosos, mm-hmm. which was a compilation of best yeah. of and things like that. And just every day I had to do a story and host the show years into yeah. it. But there was this part of it that was, I was very young. I was 20 when I signed my contract. Um, I was covering all these artists. I was living this glamorous life. I started coming out in magazines. And, and so, and at the same time, I was being pushed to like, listen, this is entertainment. And what the audience wants is to see some skin and you're, there, I could never have enough makeup and my hair could never be big enough. And so that part, I, you know, it was never like, you know, gun to your head, you have to do right, this, right. No. but it was like, it's how you got ahead. Exactly. If you want yeah. to get places, if you want to get the job, if you want to get there, wherever there is. And I always thought that by getting there, the bigger I got within, you know, bigger in terms of, um, presence on camera, time on air, all that, that I was going to be able to transition into news. And the yes. opposite happened. Yes. It became indispensable in a way. And they were yes. like, what? News? Why? Are you? No, you're, you're good here. You right. work here. Why, right. Why are you going to want to go do news? Um, and now my persona was like, I have no credibility. I remember trying to do a news magazine show and it was like, I did a couple of stories and Somebody said, listen, the gods have spoken. No more of that new stuff. And that's how, you know, I left uh, to NBC. But using the ease on camera, the production skills, the writing skills, the, the, same. the everything, everything. They're, I know they're totally translatable. Production. They're yeah, totally yeah, translatable. The when I the interviewing, when I heard uh, I was from my desk constantly praying when is she going to get out? When is she going to get out? The longer she's there, the more she's going to get pigeonholed. When is she going to get out? Yeah. And, and honestly, honestly, yeah. honestly, I knew it because I could feel it in my bones yeah. too. And I had seen yeah. it. It's almost like when people start in a newsroom as a producer, but they really want to be talent. To be there yeah. too. Now, what did you do? You grabbed the camera and you went to do your own thing. No, no tiene nada la cara. Está quieta, está bella. I was like, what is this? No tiene nada. You got no yes. smuts. Don't worry. No, pero agarraste tu cámara and you decided to take matters in your own hands, which is what Anderson Cooper did. A lot of people who want to make it uh, 
that are of a different, well, you're of a different generation. Anderson is older than me, but you were not afraid to grab your own equipment and go do a yeah. documentary. Yeah. And that was, I mean, part of that was sometimes you really need to be like shoved into an experience mm -hmm. because of a lack of options. I always wonder, you know, what would have happened had I stayed at NBC, you know, long term? Who would I be? What experiences would I have gathered? I would have probably continued covering like, you know, kind of soft news stories, some hard news stories, a lot of weather, um, a lot of crime stories, but, you know, kind of relying on the resources of the network around mm -hmm. and not really gotten to learn how to direct, how to produce a long, you know, <laughs> form feature. I, mm -hmm. you know, become an actual investigative reporter. Uh, travel on my own, risk my life, discover my passion for the adrenaline stories that matter, you know, the high adrenaline, and really discover my voice. I, I feel like up until recently, in a way, up until I moved to Sacramento and started working at ABC 10, I always was kind of, in a way, having to play a role. You know, initially, it was the bombshell, which, mm. I mean, I mean, I never felt I can't, I mean, you can ask anyone in Perpetua, I was popular. It's not like, oh, I was this dork and then somebody put makeup mm -hmm. on me and suddenly I didn't know how to walk on heels. That wasn't mm -hmm. me. I was always like makeup and things like that. But mm -hmm. I, you know, the whole bombshell thing was just not my style. Mm -hmm. I had to play that role. I had to play, you know, coqueta on camera. And then when I went into news, I wanted to bury that. I didn't, I remember people finding out. I remember... Uh, somebody who's now a friend wrote an article for Huffington Post that was comparing my image at Univision and my image at uh, at uh, NBC. And mm. I, it, o sea, frío. I remember I was like, oh my God, they're going to find out that I was doing silly television, you know, like. Mm -hmm. So then I needed to play. I was just wearing the suits and like so yeah. serious. And, and mm -hmm. as I know that you've also struggled with sounding, you know, whiter and more American than, yeah. the, you know, whitest American, like right. no accent, pronounce, right. you know, every word as it should be, um, things like that, that I was, I felt like there's no one like me here and everybody's suspicious because I was the youngest correspondent, I was 25, I came from Spanish language TV and I mm -hmm. came from entertainment, so I had mm -hmm. the worst imposter syndrome ever, so I was kind of playing that role, then I started freelancing for Vice and I was like, well, you know, I'm not like the ultimate hipster with like a face tattoo, you know. I, have I brew, I brew beer. I brew beer. I yeah, smoke like, weed. I, I drink kombucha. Yeah, well, I, I, I know you do. I know you do, but you, know, you live in California now. You live in California now. That's a function of California. But I remember, you know, at the time it was like, you know, the, the wolf pack, the boys club. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm, you know, the roughest, toughest girl here. It was like rip shirts and like weird piercings and odd tattoos. And also it was like, and nobody asked me for these things. It was me trying, trying to play the role to have a job. And then, mm -hmm. God, you know, I got this job in Sacramento. I was... I was literally homeless at the time. I was hoping that I would get a job in New York. I was going to start grad school at Columbia, had zero money, had already, you know, burned through my 401k. And uh, my agent called who, thank God, never left me. I was going <laughs> to say, I know. Times. Yeah. Uh, Mark McGrath and Henry Reich, shout out. Love them to death. They're my family. Um, through those times, never abandoned me when it was really hard. When, you know, my name was like toxic in news and I had had these terrible experiences. So they, you know, they said, there's this job in Sacramento. It's local. They're looking for an investigative reporter. They love you. You should take it. And I was like, what? No, I, no, no, no. I'm doing the vice thing. I'm doing the New York thing. I'm, you know, and at some point, um, I remember and I, actually Henry, yeah, my agent asked me where, where, what are you up to? Like, I think he was probably asking to see, you know, come over, let's meet or something. Let's talk about this. And I was like, oh, I'm on my way uh, for a job training. <laughs> and he's like, oh, really? Where? And um, I'm like, well, as a hostess at a restaurant in the village, <laughs> which like less than minimum wage, <laughs> you know, pay to live on my cousin's couch. So mm -hmm. I took that job and thank God I did because I was able to just tell the stories that I cared about, be, you know, have my voice cover 
everything from, you know, the true crime stuff that I'm addicted to in my spare time <laughs> to the housing, right? Housing crisis that. Tengo un problema. My family's worried. Oh, yeah. 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 Sí, okay. porque yo todo lo, everything I see. Yeah. Yeah. Many of us. I, I'd like some recommendations. I'm running out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. I have so many. I have so many. I'm, I have actually stopped it quite a bit lately. And I think it's only because <laughs> I ran out. Yeah. <laughs> Not, not because you, not because you were worried. Not because your husband was like, "I think you're gonna hurt somebody." He makes fun of me. He's so disturbed. Like, you know, he walks into the room, and I'm like, "Leave me alone. I'm relaxing." Meanwhile, I'm watching the, you know, the the new Netflix uh, Ramirez series. What's it called? The Night Stalker series. Oh, just saw it. <laughs> yeah, saw it's it. so good. So good. But um, oh, sorry, you froze a little. You saw. I haven't oh. finished it, but. I love it. No, no, no. no. You're, back. You're back. So yeah, um, in Sacramento, you could do all that. And and kind of like also, I love that you said that you found your roots kind of taking a few steps backwards because after being in the network, I know what you meant that yeah. you didn't want to go to Sacramento and, and that you didn't want to work in a regular newsroom when you weren't going to be hip. And yeah. you just had to, you had to find that ground again. Yeah. And, and it's like everybody who believed in me knew it from my age yes. to my dad, yeah. to the news director there, to my mentors, uh, everyone who knew me and knew what I was capable of doing. Just my mom, of course, they yeah. all knew like, this is the right thing. And that was at the time when my grandmother died. Yeah. Bella Gonzalez. Yeah. She died exactly when I had, when I was pondering uh, that job offer. And so it was kind of a spiritual, you know, message del Mahaya. I used to always ask her for advice, professional advice. She did everything, lived the most purposeful life of anyone I know. And I, and I kind of, in my own introspection, kind of asked her. And the answer was so clear. You know, I, I remember I went from her funeral to the interview or to the training or something. Yeah, I think to the interview. And I walked away and I had this piece of like, I am exactly where I need to be. And, you know, and as everything else in my life and career, it's just things just click. It's what they call that flow, you know, like it aligned. It's I had to learn everything that I had to learn. And then I had to get to this place to to do the push ups, to find my voice, to find my passion, to develop the skill, to develop community, to really be part of the community I was covering because that had never happened. Right. I had always worked in national platforms. Right. But, and it's a know, completely I, different school. It's a completely, completely different thing. I I found stories because I would hang out and go and talk to the people in the homeless encampments. Um, yeah. You know, and, you know, what's your story? And then I'd be like, you know what? Let's let's tell your story on TV and let's and and through that local connection come back to, oh, that's right. This is why I was passionate about this. Right. Right. So you are at CBS now. So yeah, I'm a freelance correspondent at CBS News. Mm -hmm. I generally cover the COVID uh, wrap every Sunday on uh, weekend news. Yeah, uh, but I, I, you know, I'll, I'll do CBSN. Um, I was recently earlier this week or last week talking about the Proud Boys uh, on CBSN, and then I'll uh -huh. switch to COVID, and then so general assignment reporting for all the platforms. Uh, on on CBS News. Do you see this picture now? Look at the pretty graphic we made you. you Are you it? just doing this to show that I haven't aged a day in the there 10 years go. that have passed? Mm -hmm. Girl, no, you haven't because this is the Caribbean oil we all have. I saw your mom. You've got good genes too. Oh yeah, my mom. Yeah, I definitely do. Yeah. Oh yeah, we age well. Daughter. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I I honestly can tell how comfortable you are with yourself now, and it makes me extremely happy. You know, that photo uh, <laughs> where it's it's me tossing to Meredith Vieira was my first story on the Today Show. Mirate el pelo. Um, I was, I mean, pff, Mirate el pelo. I was so scared. I there was a story about this girl who had, who had, there was an intruder in her house, and she attacked him with a pink gun, which if you're Puerto Rican, that pink gun is a joke that can sound like something else if you say it fast enough, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was an actual, <laughs> every time they mentioned it, he said pink gun and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna say pink gun on air. 
<laughs> yeah, see. <laughs> anyway, I'll never forget. See, beauty queen shoots intruder with a pan. Yeah. I'll never forget when they called me and they're like, hey, you got to drive to so and so. It was my first mm -hmm. network story. And it was the first time I ever came out on national television reporting on a news story in English. And I was so scared. I was so nervous. I mean, I still get nervous for sure. Oh my goodness. I do you my biggest fear, which my coworkers are very cool with, is that you and I are fluent, but there are days of the week where sometimes the word just pops in my brain in Spanish. Oh, and I you're tired. can't translate. I can by Oh, by Friday, like the, if they're, and I can see it vividly in my brain and I'm like, I don't know how, yeah, uh, okay, I'm going to go yeah, for the simplest word. You know, my biggest fear is not necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. talking, you know, speaking Spanish. That I'm like, oh yeah, I'll brag. Because now, of course, I'm yeah. sure that when you crossed over, mm -hmm. it was more of an issue. Now yeah. it's like, a, now it's like. It's cool. something that adds, not something Edgy. that takes away. Exactly. It's something that they're like, oh, wow. I mean, I'm on my way now to do an interview. I'm not driving, but after. Um, to do an interview for evening news in Spanish. Mm -hmm. In Spanish. The person does not speak English, and she's going to be in the news. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not tonight. It's for a later feature. But um, but the idea is, is I, I, think, I think we have, as a community, demonstrated the importance of being bi bilingual and the advantage that it is that we have to be able to communicate so well in, in both languages. But I think back then it might have been different. For me, the biggest fear, I'm I'm like, a, I'm a bit of a space cadet. I do kind of zone out. You know, if I'm in an interview, I won't forget. Mm. Sometimes I've forgotten the next question, but it's only because I'm listening and then I'm listening. like, oh, and I'll ask you something. But going live, you know, the three, two, one, I'm terrible with memory, you know, and I, my fear is not remembering who I am or why I'm here. <laughs> oh, it's existential. It's existential. No, tuyo es existencial. It's absolutely existential. It's more like, you know, what is this a simulation? You know, it's like, to, and it's, it's like, you I, need to stop listening to those podcasts. You need to yeah. stop. You know, it's like, yeah, I swear, I'm like, oh, the Matrix. I go on this, like, psychedelic journey in my head, like, you know, is this real or not? <laughs> that's, that's the kombucha, I, I can get, see, you know, here I am drinking kombucha and mate. I, I, oh, there I you go. Mate there for you. energy. But I think it's a little bit more of that, of, like, in news, especially now, because, you know, when I was in Sacramento working locally, my stories were limitless. I mean, the Puerto Rico yeah. documentary was 23 minutes long. Now, the oh my is, god, that was for Sacramento, yeah, that was for Sacramento. For How Sacramento. lucky were you? I know I went to Mexico like three times, I went to the border a bunch of times. I they allowed me to take a hiatus and go do the uh, Discovery Channel show <laughs> and then come back and finish my contract. It was amazing, and I was I, able to go to Puerto Rico. That because you know, like, I remember when I left Univision, um. The president of Univision then told me that uh, they, the Amer that Americans were going to hate me, that um, I was going to be just the flavor of the month for a little bit. I know. But I that, yeah, that I was <laughs> that they weren't going to embrace me, and that he was giving me a really big opportunity hosting this show. And I said, "We'll see." And then I remember my agent then said, "Listen, I just want you to prepare for the TV critic in Chicago, Rock Feeder. He's really." difficult and and uh and he may have an issue with you and i'm like we'll see mm -hmm. uh rob feeder hasn't i mean like rob feeder loves me thank god chicago yeah. embraced me and my co-worker not you are the funnest person to watch on television by miles <laughs> like i don't know anyone who is that magnetic like I oh. you bring us there it's like, I don't know if you've been watching uh, Firefly Lane on mm -hmm, Netflix. Mm -hmm. This Carol Mansour character, but in the show, she's evil. But it's mm -hmm. like, I see, and it's like, like, you know, that person who always has something fascinating to show, to where, you know, really taking into whatever it is and always having a blast, you know, <laughs> as yeah. opposed to like this, you know, the ridiculous, you know, features Carol Mansour of that show. But I did, but I did, but exactly. But this is why I do Wednesday wine so that I can yeah. do 
so that I can have these longer conversations so that I am not pigeonholed. That's why I do stand up comedy. That's why I, I, I've, I'm as lucky as you were in Sacramento that my bosses are like, you want to go cover the aftermath of the hurricane go. And I'm like, well, Mm, it's, it's very personal. It doesn't matter you know, your community wants to hear from it. So I think, uh, I'm going to tell you my takeaway from our story is that life is not plan A, <laughs> that you yeah, have to pursue I, your dreams. Yeah. That you and, have that to pursue no, and I've heard you talk about this. I think in your, in your TEDx talk, you talked about this, how everybody thinks that the path is, and I was talking to a young journalist uh, last week or two weeks ago who's graduating Berkeley in a year and a half and has the same fire in her belly that I had when I was a junior at University of Miami fighting the Dean to let me intern before it was even allowed because I needed these credits before I could intern. And I was telling her, listen, whoever tells you that you have to go to a small market and then from a small market to a medium market and then to a medium market to a network, and that is the definition of success, lives in 1984. Like, forget it. You you do you. You find your voice, and right now, the most you know, the most interesting journalists, some of the most interesting people doing the most interesting things out there in journalism, are people who didn't even in broadcast journalism who didn't necessarily follow that path, you know. And it's like, why are things formatted in this way? And it, and I said, unfortunately, until that changes, I would recommend for you to just avoid that path because you're going to become jaded in the process, mm-hmm. because there's going to be people who tell you a million ways, I mean, in a million different ways that, you know what, that's not how you should do it. This is how you should do it. And by the end of mm-hmm. that, you know, I have friends who are brilliant, just perfect in terms of like their 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 storytelling, their, their camera work. And they've been told that they were doing it wrong so many times that they completely lost who they were. And we're all subject yeah. to that. I mean, I did too, yeah. but I feel so fortunate that I've had such a diversity of of platforms and places that have picked up my stories that it's like an amalgamation of all of those different brands and styles and whatever. And at the end of the day, it's way too confusing to be all those people for all those different platforms. So it's like, I'm just going to be me. And exactly. if you like me, air me. And that's the advantage you guys have now. When I started, I had to follow that path. And I was lucky because I had Spanish. I was fully bilingual. Yeah. And I could go to come to Chicago to do news at the number three market in Spanish at age 21. Now, you, I, it's what I tell, I tell the, the same kids that approach me. I'm like, start your own YouTube channel. Go yes. do whatever documentary you want. Airtime is airtime. I'm watching stuff on YouTube and I'm 46. You know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's um, going to stand out. I mean, if you have, yeah. I don't know, a hundred people sounding the same, doing the same, dressing the same, telling the same story in the same format, yep. like how, how are you going to stand out? Well, my friend, thank you so much for joining me. I know you have an interview coming up. I have a, I have traffic on that. <laughs> I know. How long is it? How long is it going to take you? No, you know what? I made sure to park close enough. So I'm probably going to be in the interstate for like 10 minutes and then get off. And do it. All right. Well, I'm so happy that you're happy. I'm, I'm happy that you are Likewise. able to show the world how amazing you are. And now and now we're connected. Whatever yes, you need. Your phone. Now we need to do this, but like without the audience so we can actually like trash talk all in one. Exactly. Exactly. It was great to see <laughs> you, love. with wine next time. I know. Yes. Thankfully, you didn't do it this time because you were driving. Come on. I'm driving. <laughs> and I'm going to, just so you guys know, you can, um, so this is, oh, crap. You know what? I wanted to talk about yes. Guerreras Ajenas. Tell me yes. about that. Yes. Guerreras. Yes. 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 I'm sorry. Well, Go ahead. That's, how, that's the more like feminist version of, <laughs> of Guerreras Ajenas. Um, Oye, lo, so leí, gonna... lo leí cuatro veces y lo leí mal. No worries. <laughs> my, my biggest passion uh, subject wise, or, you know, series of passions are within like the way that black markets work and the failures of the drug war. And so, um, when I was kind of figuring out what to do next with my life and career, I decided to, I wanted to do a documentary. I had been, it was 2012 marijuana had been legalized recreationally in Washington and, uh, Colorado at that time. So I realized that drug policy was about to take a massive shift in the U S and so I, wa- I decided to come up with that, this idea to do a series about the consequences of the war on drugs 
throughout, you know, South Central America coming into the U.S. And so I went to Colombia uh, with a, I hired a friend of a friend who was doing music videos. And I was like, we're going to do a documentary. He was Colombian. He was shitting his pants. <laughs> he was like. He's like, where crazy. is this Puerto Rican crazy woman taking me? Claro. I was like, I'm not going. So I wasn't too aware of how sure. the park were. <laughs> I was like, well, they said we might get kidnapped, but I don't think that's going to happen. And I was like, no, we're leaving this town now. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I went and gathered all these stories about coca farmers and um, just how they are, they're really the bottom of the food chain. And they're mm -hmm. the ones bearing the brunt of the U.S. led and designed policies against the war on drugs. So I put together their, um, like a little trailer and was able to, shot that around and maybe like a year after I started filming or maybe even two, uh, mm -hmm. HBO Latin America uh, bought the project and uh, sent me out to Colombia to direct like a 15 person crew had never directed anything that long in my life. And so sobre la marcha, that's the other thing I tell people is like, especially women, especially girls. Like if you don't know how to do something, there's YouTube, there's Google. Don't ever say that you don't know that you're not trained. Well, I don't know how to use this program. Whatever. You'll learn. Sobre la marcha. Because men, o sea, they fake oh. it till they make it every day. And so I was able to direct this documentary. And um, it's out there on HBO. It's still on HBO Max. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, I found cool. it there. And um, <laughs> recently I was like, oh, good. They kept it. <laughs> Oh, good. that's awesome. That's awesome. So you can, you can check that out and you can also check out her beautiful website because that website is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank so you. well done. Lilia Luciano. And of course, weekends on CBS news, one of them hosted from Chicago by the yes. very own. I love Adriana. Well, that's how Ad we connected because you commented on her something. Qué vergüenza. Que vergüenza. Yes, because she did a segment on the Cielito Lindo family, yes, which you yes. sent to her. Which I found and sent to her. Six degrees of Lynn Manuel Miranda. That's how it is, girl. And now just go to, now ve dile a Ricky que yo no como gente, that I'm a really nice person. That I just need one short she, interview. She won't hurt you. She just wants to kiss you. And it got it. Cuidado, tampoco así. Yo soy una muchacha fina. To tell you, I told him my mom has the sheets ready. I know, well, I, know, I was like, I know you have a house in Dorado, but listen, mommy's but already you sitting in the room. You come stay with my parents. It's a, diff a different entrance for you. You don't have to come in yeah. with us. Yeah. And a uh, big, important question. Have your parents gotten the vaccine yet? Yes. That's yes. That's the new, like, it, you it's, you know, life? No, you know what it is? It's like, te llegó la luz. After yes. Hurricane Maria. After Maria. It was the Maria. happiest text I've gotten in a year when my mom, when my sister-in-law sent me a picture of my dad getting vaccinated. Oh, same, same, yeah. same. Igual, when my dad sent it to me. And then my mom took a while. My dad is um is a doctor and he was working a COVID unit, so he got it pretty early on. Yeah. And I was like, okay, Paul or me. And then my mom yep. got it. I was like, ahora sí que Paul or me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's how we all, everyone, I think that everyone can sympathize with us because it's a worldwide issue. Yeah, exactly. It's a worldwide issue. All right, my love. Eso fue una despedida puertorriqueña. Have a good day. Have a wonderful night. La puerta, and then next sí. Mira, otro topic. Bye. <laughs> Be safe. Be safe driving. Thank you. Bye, Lilia. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that was so much fun. I hope that you follow her. Check her out on uh, CBS News during the weekends, which, by the way, on Saturdays is hosted from Chicago by the one and only Adriana Diaz, who happens to be Dominican from New York. Not that we're pointing it out because it's not Hispanic Heritage Month, but you know, if there's one, we find them. Uh, and also, I have a stand up comedy show that's virtual coming up March 20th. Uh, I have the information on my social media. You can go to my website, anabelaval.com, and check it out. Let me see if I can get you the um, banner right here so that you can see it and uh, buy your tickets. What's really cool about this, which is different than when I was doing, you know, first of all, it's all new material. And second of all, it's the kind of thing that with one ticket, you can have your entire bubble 
um, hold on, I'm screwing this up. Well, anyway, hold on, let me go back to you guys. Da, 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 da. Oh, there it is. So you can have your entire bubble go to this event. Keep it real with Annabella Val. You can go to mykeoshow.com. It's March 20th at 7.30. So one ticket, everyone in your bubble can watch it from your house. Now be safe. Don't say that I'm making you. You don't have to have a viewing party with people you haven't seen, okay? The people that live in your house can watch it. I would say 13 and up because La Bella Val can throw a curse word here and there. But I would love to have you guys there. So uh, I've given you a ton of uh, options of how you can access that. AnnabellaVal.com, MikeyOShow.com. And I would love it if you can be there with us and check it out. Special appearances by some of the people you love from my life. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Lilia Luciano and that it encourages you to follow your dream even if the path gets bumpy, even if it's complicated, and even if you don't see the end of the tunnel. All right. Have a wonderful Wednesday, everybody. And if you're watching us on YouTube, tell us what you think. Tell us where you're watching from and subscribe. Have a great night.